When you oversleep and are late for work, it's bad. But if you oversleep while you're at work, well, that's disastrous. Hello and welcome. My name is Raymond Schaff, and I'm the author of Confessions of a Level 9 Nerd. Please buy a copy at Amazon.com and read the book. Then drop it off at your local police station and tell them it would be a crime not to read it. I have included a list of requirements for being a Level 1 through Level 9 Nerd at the end of the video if you're interested. And, as usual, there is a great Level 9 Nerd tip near the end of this video explaining how to calm people down near you without saying a single word. Now, let's wade deep into Confessions of a Level 9 Nerd as I read to you Chapter 6, Too Many Feet on a Small Floor. Gripping a fresh set of honorable discharge papers in one hand and a bride of eight weeks on the other, I felt like I had won the lottery. My wife and I climbed into our brand new 1968 Chevrolet Impala and burned ten tankfuls of gas as we rocketed from an army base in Pennsylvania all the way to the San Francisco Bay Area. Greeted by a crisp October and a warm, friendly homecoming, we began our long-term marriage in the final wreckage, what is now known as the 1960s. Three haircuts out of the military, I found myself operating a mainframe computing system for a large, upscale, regional furniture chain. The 100-year-old, eight-story monolithic headquarters building covered an entire city block in downtown Oakland, California. The first seven stories bulged with sublime displays of pricey home furnishings, leaving the eighth and final floor for the business end of the business. The breathtaking view of the San Francisco Bay Area from the computer room's top floor was an unpaid fringe benefit that brought a smile to my face each time I arrived to work. I kept beat with the working rhythms of the job for several months until a three-day holiday weekend packed with family activities pulverized my timing. A late evening, 40-minute dip into subconsciousness ended abruptly as my wife coaxed me out of our living room recliner, all the while reminding me that working on the ground floor of a computing career kept a roof over our heads. The feeble attempt to catch a few winks prior to the start of my midnight rendezvous with the corporate mainframe only teased my exhaustion. Nursing a deep cup of coffee, my swing shift counterpart greeted me with the news that it was billing night. This meant I would be babysitting our high-speed printer through the darkest morning hours as it spit out legions of customer credit card billing statements. Thirty minutes into my shift, I reached a point in the computing process where it was time to begin the multi-hour printing of credit card statements. I made my way down to the basement's bulk form storage room to snag a 150-pound roll of custom credit card billing statement paper. Using all of my youth, 
I jerked the roll of paper onto a thick metal dolly for the trip back up to the top floor. The massive roll of paper required equal amounts of patience and strength to maneuver it through the 8th floor corporate offices and into the computer room. Manipulating a special lifting tool, I hoisted the roll of paper up onto the loading mechanism directly in front of our mainframe's IBM 1403 high-speed line printer. A Model N one for you geeks out there. After threading a leader from the massive paper roll into the high-speed printer, I launched the printing process, sending the roll of credit card statement paper on its slow, circular journey to oblivion. With perfect precision, the line printer blasted customer data onto statement paper and ejected it over the top of the printer while unraveling another length of paper from the massing rotating roll. What? Massive rotating roll. The convoluted process continued on the back side of the printer as the newly inked form curled up into a machine that stripped, burst, and then stuffed the statements into separate windowed mailing envelopes. From front to back, the entire dancing paper circus kept itself busy, requiring minimal human intervention as the harmonizing one beat at a time, one beat at a time, one beat at a time printing rhythm mesmerized a tired mind like mine. Two hours and twice as many cups of coffee later, I found myself trailing in the battle to keep my urge to sleep in check. Passing the halfway mark of statement printing, I decided to escape the sterile confines of the computer room for a much-needed break. I slipped down to the seventh floor to inspect the displays of pricey home furnishings. Bathed in the glow of ancient security lighting, a cluster of hand-stitched leather chairs and sofas called out to me in the tomb-like silence. I oozed down into a buttery leather couch and felt the stress melt out of my body. A covey of stately grandfather clocks across the aisle began serenading me with the arrival of 3 a.m. My eyelids yielded to the gentle melodies floating out of the handcrafted timepieces, lifting me off into what was become a horrible nightmare. Time stood still as I opened my eyes to the piercing glare of a powerful flashlight heating my face. My heart began pumping beats of pure fear. I was supposed to be alone in the old eight-story building. The harsh light triggered an adrenaline rush throughout my body, making the surrounding silence unbearable. My fear took a left turn into total confusion as I realized the intense beam of light was actually coming from outside the seventh floor window of the building. I could not rationalize how anyone could be standing outside shining a flashlight in as I was seven stories above the city streets. It took me a few seconds to take control of my fear and realize that the violent rays of light coming from the outside were the first signs of the morning sunrise peeking over the city's eastern horizon. The razor-sharp streams of white and orange beams flooding in through the seventh floor windows forced my brain functions up past maximum processing speed. My brain seized a moment and alerted me to the fact that I had left the statement printing process running unattended upstairs 
for an unknown amount of time. I leapt out of my warm, leathery display couch, leaving a deep impression of what was seconds earlier a comfortable nap. Bolting up a flight of stairs and into the corporate offices, I reached a full sprint just before slamming in the inward opening double doors of the computer room. The unyielding shock of resistance sent me hurtling backwards flat on my back. I got up on my knees and peered through the computer room's dense glass security windows to see ribbons of blank credit card billing statement paper looped around, up, over, and through everything. Fear fed my arms enough strength to force the double hinged doors inward, enabling me to crawl underneath unfurled mountains of blank credit card statement paper. When I reached the vicinity of the computer system's high-speed printer, I discovered the once massive roll of statement paper had disgorged its entire contents throughout the computer room. A thin wire bail breaking sensor on the paper roll holder broke hours earlier, allowing hundreds of feet of blank statement paper a free reign throughout the room. I looked up into the silent line printer assembly to see a crumpled wad of ink drenched statement paper jammed inside its powerful chain-driven jaw. I gave brief thanks to the IBM design engineers for putting emergency shutdown sensors all over that printer. Otherwise, I would have been running full speed down out our emergency exit stairway trying to get away from a huge fire on the eighth floor. With no time to spare, I hustled up a new roll of blank statement paper from the basement storage room and restarted the printing process from the point of the paper jam. Shots of anxiety crisscrossed my body as I tried to think of a way to get rid of the ocean of blank paper that filled the computer room. I considered tossing long segments out the eighth floor window while holding on to one end. This would get the kinks out of the paper and allow me to hand roll each segment back up through the window. However, basic physics told me that the sheer weight of some of the longer strands might snap off and fall to the city street below, making an already bad situation into a personal job loss event for me. Common sense prevailed, forcing me to spend two painfully hard hours sitting on the floor while hand-rolling ribbons of blank statement paper. The empty box from the current roll of statements pouring through the printer served as storage device for the dozens of small roll segments. It was a perfect example of multitasking. I rolled up chunks of blank statement paper while babysitting the high speed line printer feeding off the new roll. When everything finished, I dragged a box containing dozens of short blank rolls of statement paper down to the basement storage room, concealing it deep behind the other statement roll boxes. Near the end of my graveyard shift, the day shift boss approached me with a four-foot length of credit card statement paper in his hands. It was blank. My heart pounded out emergency signals of doom and gloom as he told me he found the length of paper behind one of the mainframe tape drive units on the other side of the computer room. He said somewhat annoyingly, this four-foot stripper credit card billing stock paper is expensive. 
so try to be careful with how you handle it and not waste any. I responded, I can only imagine how you would feel if that roll you were holding was 20 or 30 feet long. We shook our heads at such an unimaginable situation, and then I left for home. <laughs> I waited several days before the next billing cycle hit, before going back into the form's storage room to dig out my hidden box of short rolls of blank statement paper. I spent multiple hours hand-feeding the stubby rolls into our line printer in order to get rid of the incriminating evidence. I decided I would never go down to the seventh floor to nap during the billing statement printing again. I learned my lesson well. And from that point forward, I simply borrowed a couple of large pillows from the sixth floor bedroom displays and slept on the floor next to the printer in the computer room during the long and tedious printing process. Thank you. Thank you. Stress is a horrible thing. Stress can make you feel like a prisoner no matter who you are or what you do in this life. One thing that might help you deal with stress is to surround yourself in color for a few minutes each day. To be clear, a specific color known as Baker Miller Pink. For some unknown reason, this shade of pink has a calming effect on many people. There seems to be a lot of opinions on this gentle color that releases a calmness through its warming presence. The internet will give you the pros and cons of what other people think, but you should experiment with it and draw your own conclusions. And finally, it's time to slide open my wall safe for a safe, off-the-wall story about teaching logic to college students. There was a time in my computing career I had the privilege of being an adjunct college instructor teaching a variety of information technology courses. To keep my young college students on their toes, I would give regular quizzes as part of my curriculum. During each semester, I had one quiz that contained 20 true or false questions. I made sure that the first 19 questions would be false, and the 20th question was written as follows. The answer to all 20 questions in this quiz are false. This was my way of introducing them to the world of computer programming logic. After taking the quiz, I would tell them that they enjoyed that kind of logic generated by question 20, they should consider a career in computer programming. Otherwise, choose something less logical. I kept beat with the working rhythms of the conga. 
cut, I kept beating the working rhythms of the job <laughs> until the job simply gave up. <laughs> cut. I kept betting that I would win the lotto. Cut. <laughs> 